So we are going to do a Q&A panel with Paula and Eric. So we will start with an icebreaker question for Paula. So I've seen that in celebration of Clojure, getting the Clojure Java math namespace, you've ported it over to ClojureScript, which is super awesome because we love to see you doing more ClojureScript stuff. You said that unfortunately you've run into the problem that the JavaScript math isn't as capable as the Java math though. So you've had to re-implement a lot. What was the toughest part of doing this? The IEEE remainder function. There's a, <clears throat> there's a function for um, dividing one uh, double 64 bit double by another one and then finding the remainder value from that as accurately as possible. And that was, um, that was really tough to get right. Um, the, uh, the code was available in C on the JDK uh, because it's released as GPL. Um, anyway, I, uh, I ported it into JavaScript and then once I had it working right there, that helped me, helped me get it right in ClojureScript. Um, there's a lot of bit operations and the, um, uh, there's expectations of having access to different word sizes that, and you can change uh, the pointer types. Um, and this is what C was doing internally. And, uh, you know, the way I had to make that work in, in ClojureScript was really quite difficult, but yeah, I've, I've got it working and um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, let me do uh, like the icebreaker for Eric as well. And we want to ask what is your favorite dish to cook and why it's not cookies? Because <laughs> uh, I would eat too many cookies. That's the, that's the answer to the second question. What do I like to cook? I like to cook gumbo. I really like to cook gumbo. It's fun. There it's a you nice go. process. And what are the ingredients for that? Well, first you start with a roux, which is um, flour and an oil. And you toast toast the flour in that. Um, gumbos have a pretty dark roux. If you're used to making a roux from French cooking, it's, it's a bit much darker. And so it kind of has this exciting aspect of um, uh, testing your cardiovascular health uh, because uh, it's you, you can burn it and you want to take it right up to the point before you burn it. So it's kind of a game of chicken with, with your flour. Then, right. then you can put whatever you want, but I tend to put in okra. Gumbo is one of those kind of like empty your fridge of all the little ends and bits that you got left over from other things uh, and just throw it into a big soup. Well, okay. hopefully next time I'm in New Orleans, you will cook some for me. I'm holding, I'm holding sure, to that. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a hand raised egg Davis. Uh, yeah, I asked this on the Discord, but uh, then I was reminded that you all are in, enjoying questions being in person. Um, Eric, I was thinking recently about um, causal loop diagrams. I don't know if you've run across those. I, or I just clicked that. on the link that you shared. I have not come across them. So I'm going to check them out. Um, yeah, are these these are kinds of like systems analysis, uh, exactly. feedback loop kind of things? Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, mostly I've seen them as like ways of exploring physics stuff. Um, mm. But just recently occurred to me that it could be really um, interesting as a way of modeling uh, domain business domains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll check them out. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's get Paula back in here. Ray on the Discord asked, Paula, can you tell us something about your graph database, Asami? What was the motivation behind it and what sorts of problems it's a good fit for? I would like to add, uh, how long have you been working on it? And uh, tell us a little bit more about the name. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of aspects to that question. Um, I had been working on a previous RDF database called Moldara for over 10 years that was written in Java and I lost interest over time because it was written in Java and I was into closure by that point. 
uh, I had an idea of re-implementing in Clojure, but hadn't really got to it until um, an element that I'd written for Mogara was a rules engine, uh, which does this bottom-up evaluation for data log. And uh, I had this idea that I could redo that for uh, any graph database if I just hit the database behind a protocol. So I tried this with Datomic and showed my boss at work who said, you should try this for um, uh, at work because we need to do some inferencing. And he didn't like the idea of working with a commercial system. He said, I could take the rules engine, which was open source and do, um, I needed to talk to an open source graph database. Um, we weren't aware of DataScript. And so I started doing something in memory uh, and that became Asami. Uh, and then I kept adding features to it in my own time, including the, the storage layer, which I did last year during a pandemic. Um, and it sort of, it grew a lot from that. Um, the, so it's like Mulgara, but it's entirely in closure and it's a, um, uh, it's taken on a lot of the new indexing ideas that I've had in the last 20 years. Um, as for the name, uh, we had a number of projects at Cisco um, where my manager was really into uh, Avatar, The Last Damp Edna, and the, um, and the sequel, Cora. And uh, so a number of projects were named after characters in those shows. Well, the character Asami was um, Asami Sato. Uh, while some of the other characters had these like superpowers with the, the bending, uh, she didn't have anything like that, but she uh, knew technology and she would build things uh, for herself so that she joined in with her friends. And uh, I like that idea because, um, you know, I didn't have a graph database and uh, I built one myself. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. That's one of my favorite um, fun facts about Asami. Um, let's go back over to Renzo to hear more from Eric. Yeah, so I have a question for Eric. Um, do you think that the traditional roles uh, found in most agile software companies are equipped to handle the domain driven model that you are advocating for? And could we need to add additional supportive roles between product managers and technical leaders? Wow. Um, I have not thought much about how this fits in with the sort of um, black box ticket, ticket machine that we've created with the current agile system. I'm not a big fan of the way, um, the way I see agile working. So I'll just, I'll put it that way. Um, the, what I see is that uh, business people, project owners or whatever, product owners, whatever they're called, uh, just add tickets and then the programmers just do the tickets and there's very little, um, because the program, it's easier, the asymmetry of it, the programmer is working longer on the ticket than it took to write. So it's always easier to get a longer backlog than you can actually finish. And so the programmers never really have time to get a global view of the tickets coming in and like, what model are we actually making? Um, and so I don't know if it would fit into agile at all to say like, Hey, let's, let's take a break and do some design work and some sketches and like, maybe your, all these tickets don't make sense anymore. Um, so I will elaborate, Eric, because that was actually a question for me. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I think that traditionally we have like the product people and they know all the product stuff and they don't care or know about the code. Then we have all the code people and they know all the mm -hmm. code stuff and that's all they care about. But not a lot of companies have like the glue holding them together. And a lot of no. times, you know, um, software engineers or, you know, um, customer success people will, will try to fill those roles, but I guess I, I think your domain-driven model kind of 
advocate advocates for the requirement of an additional role in a company that's like between understands technical but isn't leading technical and understands product mm. isn't a product manager but can help those two so talks. i mean this this is something that i don't think i'm prepared to discuss fully but there is a, a great book called um the inmates are running the asylum and it's about the problem of just having these two roles of like business and dev and uh, it argues for a third design role who, cause the business is, they're really trying to maximize profits, right? So more, more income, less, less cost. And the programmers are kind of trying to make their job easier, um, you know, do the job, but do as little as possible. And uh, there's no one advocating for the user really. And um, the user is the kind of the person that the model has to serve uh, ultimately. It does help the programmers, right? By having it making, if you have a good model, the model that you, that actually serves the users, it's easier to write code that serves the users. If your model is um, different from what the users actually need, then you're gonna have to write all these complicated code to like adapt it all the time and that's what's going to lead to all this complexity so i think that that's a good direction like having this third role who's kind of advocating for the user and then that lets you have some sort of team of of maybe a special team of three uh stakeholders who can come together and talk about the model outside of the code um, I think that's another problem in agile is that you, the programmers um, are asked to do uh, the, both the low level, like let's make these tickets happen and the high level um, a sort of evaluate these tickets and like understand the context and switch between that really quickly. And so you never have a, a you, like, you're going from this like engineering, like just get it work at like whatever it takes, get it to work. And then you have to switch to a, wait, maybe we don't want to do this. What's the context? Like, and, and that is very hard for your brain to do that. And I've seen it happen in companies where it's like a programmer will be coding up to the wire. Now we have a meeting to like evaluate these tickets. Like your brain needs an hour at least. I, maybe you even need like, a week from if you're doing if you've been doing coding a lot so i find that that's another problem like there's there's a human aspect a psychological aspect missing from agile yeah the cost of context switching is yeah. certainly a, a cost we underestimate um okay going back to paula we have a question from jacob on discord he says comparing the performance of retrieving a whole data entity for example a person from an RDF database versus an RDBMS is the former significantly slower because it has join on each attribute or is it just as fast because all the attributes are stored next to each other in the EAV index? It's a little bit slower, but in general, your bottleneck is in, uh, uh, is in your storage and you know, these days that's often as likely to be in the cloud as it is locally. And so um, the work to bring those things together into a local entity is, is trivial in comparison to waiting for this stuff, even coming off this. Uh, if you have a lot of things cached, yeah, there's a small performance cost there, but generally uh, when you retrieve this data, it'll usually be co-located. You can bring it in, you can restructure it and return it. If it's in memory, it'll be a little bit slower. And if you run it through, say, Criterion, you'll see that difference. Um, but in general, you're going to see records come in and be restructured as an entity uh, at, a, at a similar pace. It's, it's the um, tertiary storage, which is the, the real cost. And yeah, locality is normally all right when it comes to that tertiary storage. 
So we can perhaps take the next question from Felipe. Hi. Um, th this is a question for Eric. Uh, hi, Eric. Uh, hi. Great talk. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to ask a bit about the process because what, what you've described is, is, is obviously a, a process by which like, you come to certain results. Um, but a, a big part of how like this, this sort of, this thing ends up you having the need for this process is the fact also that um, like there is a disconnect, like the people that have the model, uh, maybe they're not talking all the time with the people that don't have the model in their heads. Um, so like even in the example you gave, it's like a multi-step process by which at the at some point someone realized maybe we should look at the model. Um, so my question is like, how do you actually, in what ways have you had success? Like actually putting down this model, collaborating with other people on this model, and actually iterating over this model in the times that it's actually important to change it and update it. Mm, mm, mm. So these are all really good questions, and um, it's a little bit outside the scope of what I had in mind. Um, so. Uh, but it's really good question. So now I'm thinking maybe I need to talk about it, but I'm also thinking maybe I focus too much on process and not enough on the, the sort of underlying groundwork of what, what you can even do at, at a domain model level before, and at like an abstract level before you get into code. Um, so that, that, thank you. This is really good information. So I do, I, but I do want to answer your question. So, the what you asked about what successes I've had. So there are successes like when I'm working on my own, definitely I, I will realize, oh, this model needs to be different. And then I go back to a more abstract level and I, I, um, I can work there. Of course, I'm working on my own, on my own project. Like I don't have to answer to anybody. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of like on a team, I've seen it work in the small. So maybe you realize that this, a small part of your domain could be different. Um, so for instance, maybe you're doing uh, some kind of user interaction in, the, in, the, in a GUI and you realize, oh, if we just kept a log of these instead of mutating stuff in place, uh, that would make all these things that we have to do easier. And so then you, that's a small, you know, a small place and the GUI code changes so frequently anyway, no one's going to uh, be bothered if you, um, if you'd like change a bunch of callbacks to do something different. Right. Um, at, in the large, I think that that's a, I, I think that one of the jobs that I need to do is to make it apparent uh, how is to make the argument for how valuable this can be uh, that it can speed up your development certainly, but um, it can also be because software is like basically running businesses now, like the business, how it works is like in this, in the code. Um, I think that, uh, it can give you a real business advantage uh, apart from just like the speed of, um, of development. I think that it can give you a clearer view of like, it can give the, the business, the whole, the whole company, a clearer view of the, the system that they're working with. Um, and, and, and I'm, I, I like to use this example of, um, like double entry bookkeeping. It's like, can you imagine a bank with a different model who's just like flailing all the time because they, um, they're not keeping books that well. Uh, and then someone comes up with double, or the bank that comes up with double entry bookkeeping is like beating them. And it's, it's simply a change in model. The whole business is based on a different model. It happens to be encoded in their information system. But that's happening more and more. And um, I, I think I need to come up with like, find some real world examples where 
someone with a better model actually succeeded in the in com competition because the model was different. Um, and it wasn't just, oh, we were swamped by technical debt. It's more like the, the model made their business better. So thank you so much, Felipe. I hope That's, that answers it. And we can talk offline. We can talk in the chat if you, if you want to go deeper. Sure. Let's do that. Thanks again. Thank you, Felipe. Uh, up to you, Jordan. Any, any more questions for Paula? Yes. So I'm sure there are many people that um, are looking for opportunities to contribute. And I'd like to give you a chance to a space where you have next steps you'd like to suggest to people where they can learn more, perhaps previous talks you've done in the past, good starting points for people to learn more about Asami and what you're doing. I've written a lot on the Asami wiki. I've, I've um, tried to put a lot of effort into um, like describing each of the different elements, how to go about using them, what the structures look like. Um, there's even a number of pages on what the architecture is and how things interact. It's not perfect, but you know, there's only so many hours in the day. Uh, another place to go is Datomic. They have extensive documentation. Um, they have a very fast moving project and a lot of people working on it. So I have seen the docs get out of sync with, um, with the project on occasion, but uh, it's generally quite good. So these are two really good sources. Uh, well, I, I like to think that the Asami source is a good one. Um, I put pictures in there and things, uh, but uh, I'm, While, uh, while Datomic doesn't present itself really as a graph database, and it's not particularly strong in that way compared to some which are out there, uh, it is a graph database and you can use it as such. Um, so in general, looking for graph database uh, resources can help. Um, but I think working through the Datomic uh, documentation is probably your best bet. And then if you learn about graph databases, you could build on top of that. Was there a second part to that question? I think, I think, I think you answered okay. it. All right. Thank you. So let's see, um, we are approaching the end of this lot, but we should have time for another couple of questions, I believe. So um for eric we have uh well i can't pronounce that king's nook king's nook uh, something king eric is there a standard timeline um for example two weeks to a month uh during which modeling must mature once a project requires requirements are completely understood this is the first part and then there's a second part eric would you describe or to what degree to the idea that a design be centered around areas of volatility. Thank you. So the first one, Eric, again, is uh, um, during which modeling must mature. So what is the period where modeling must mature once the project requirements are completely understood? Right. Again, this is a process question. And now I, I'm very much regretting talking about process. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's not a, like, I don't want to talk about process as much as it seems the questions are implying. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to talk about stuff like um, uh, the sizes. That's an alternative. You choose one of these three sizes. And that is an abstract thing that we can do before we jump into code, right? And that I want to catalog all these choices these possible ways of modeling different things, and then also talk about how those can be implemented in code. So, oh, uh, Clojure has these seven ways to implement alternatives, and Java has these three ways. And, you know, I wanna do stuff like that. And so it's much more about um, sort of the, the Lego bricks of domains. Uh, of, do, of domain models 
uh, how to analyze your domain to find what those things might be and then how do you translate that into a language the idea of process like oh have a three-week sprint and then write down all these things on sticky notes and like that i i'm i'm i don't think i'm that good at that so i don't i don't want to touch that um the thing about uh whether to design it around areas of volatility i think that that's that's very important and a lot of architects you know software architecture experts talk about that how um one of the this is one of the key areas of uh, uh key insights of david parnas in uh, talking about modularity is you want your modules to encapsulate this volatility um and uh, you know, an example of this is, well, well the, the wrong way to do it is you break up a house thinking about the areas of functionality. So you think of stuff like, well, there's the kitchen, that's where you make your food, there's the bathroom, there's the bedroom. And so you think of those as the modules, and then you like connect them together with doors, right? Um, but really, when you, when you look at your house, the modular stuff is different. The module, if you look at the volatility, you say, oh, wait, we need to be able to plug in different appliances at different times, right? You don't want to build in. I mean, they used to do this and they've learned it's a bad idea. Like you build in your, um, like your vacuum <laughs> cleaner system <laughs> into the house. Uh, no, you want a modular vacuum that has a plug that's also modular and you can, you know, the, the different, you know, that's the interface. It's like a standard interface that allows any module to be plugged into the, to the house. Uh, and uh, then you have like your plumbing, right? And that's like a different module. Like you wanna be able to um, put different fixtures in without like ripping down the whole house and changing all the walls, uh, you know, the plumbing in the walls. So, so looking at stuff in terms of what changes like, you know, your furniture, it's very modular. You, you can change out your furniture. You don't have to touch the house. You don't have to rebuild anything. Um, so to, to look at, to look at the, the volatility, I think is like one of the first things you should do. Um, and that's, that's kind of just architectural advice. Um, it doesn't speak so much about, um, uh, the, the, the domain model, you know, the model of the house. Um, I, I brought up volatility mostly because when you're implementing it, you have to make this choice. There's different ways to implement alternatives. You can make an enum, you can subclass an interface, or you can make it values that are like strings that you can put in a database and all of them have their uses. There's not like one that's the right way to do it. And what, but how do you decide between them? It's all about volatility. And I think that that's something that's just not discussed that much. You know, um, uh, I think that there's a tendency to say like, well, let's just subclass everything. And enum is, oh, that's just for like simple things, like simple strings that instead of using constants, like, I think that that's the wrong way to look at it. You should look at it much more like you have to change an enum if you want to add or remove something or change anything. You actually have to go open that code and change it. Whereas a subclass is open, you can just add a subclass. And then the runtime stuff, well, you just add a new row in the database. Like you don't even have to touch your code. Um, so yeah, that, that's the answer to that. Okay, great. So we are getting close to our break before our next session here. So we have one last question for Paula from Ray on Discord. And Ray says, when I see data log, I think of prolog and logic programming. Is there some synergy between Datomic and core.logic? Can the two be used together to solve more interesting problems than just data retrieval? I haven't done a lot of work with uh, Core Logic. I do know that David Nolan put some effort into um, uh, connecting it to the, the so that the assertive statements were connected to a database. 
uh, as opposed to simply being in memory. Um, I'm not sure that that would be the best approach to handle a lot of scaling issues. Uh, the sorts of rules which I was describing that that the atomic can use, uh, I think will be much more performant, but it's harder to apply than, than data log, I think. Um, and I mean, that, that uh, connection to logic programming and Prolog is quite real. It's specifically designed to be like Prolog, but over, um, uh, over a corpus of data, as opposed to a, a space which needs to be searched all the time. Um, uh, there have been numerous attempts in like the last 40 years or so of trying to integrate the two. It, certain things have been done that like in, in like this top down logic programming where solutions are searched for the way that um, the prologue does, the way that um, systems like Mini Cameron or Core Logic do. These can solve certain sorts of problems where, while um, Datalog can't really uh, approach those. However, Datalog has these restrictions on it, which let it work really, really well with, um, uh, with databases, graph databases especially, I think. Um, and while there's similarity there, there there's also things which one can do that the other doesn't really have a very good handle on. Um, personally, my experience has been that logic programming hasn't required the scalability that databases provide us. Um, and well, I mean, the, the, when I say logic programming, the complex stuff that core logic and that um, prologue are really strong at doing, I haven't seen them uh, applied to really large corpuses of data uh, to great effect. While um, if you can restrict your logic language down to what can work in data log, that works against databases exceptionally well. Um, there hasn't been a lot, there are a few cases, but there haven't been a lot of um, instances where you want that processing power of say Prolog or Core Logic. Uh, being applied to massively scalable data. And, you know, the fact that those two don't often need to intersect has been fortuitous, but um, yeah. So I know Datalog can be put over the front of a database and David Nolan has done that, not Datalog, sorry, um, Core Logic can be done over a database. David Nolan has done it, but I haven't seen it being picked up and used it anyway. Okay, great. Thank you, Paula. So we are at the end of the Q&A panel, and we would love to thank Paula and Eric for speaking today. And if you have any more questions, that Paula and Eric are both very active in the community, please reach out to them on Slack or email, and I'm sure they'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Mm -hmm.